I've, I've done a little bit of play. I, I've nowhere near as much as you. I've done a little bit of playing uh, uh, largely on very small toy truck, you know, toy projects. But, um, but one of the things that I kind of noticed was that um, in GitHub Copilot, if people haven't used it, you, you, can, you can add comments and start describing what it is that you want to build and it will start writing code for you to, to, to build that thing. And <clears throat> what that reminded me of was B my approach to BDD, where I'm trying to, disc I'm trying to capture the behaviours of my system in small user-observable increments and build a series of executable specifications in effect. And it felt an awful lot like to me, like the same kind of level of abstraction that I was needing to undertake to try and explain to the AI what I wanted the code to do. And that made me think about the, this thing about, you know, what's coming? What's, what, what are the next generation of, like, mm. of AI tools going to be like to yeah. help us do that? I and think that's another... Of course, that's kind of still the, you know... Um sometimes there's this hope oh cool this can now like generate all these things for us right yeah but it's often many of our artifacts in software delivery it's it's also about the journey to the artifact right because software delivery is still very much a team sport as long as ai cannot do a hundred percent of the things right? absolutely absolutely and so, that, get, that gets me to another thing that was going through my head when we, earlier in the conversation that, that we haven't got to yet which which i for me is key one of the things that seems really alien to me about the AIs and certainly what feels like a discontinuity with my interaction with the AI tools when, when I use them is, is that my approach is massively incremental. You know, my, my, my approach to all of it is iterative and collaborative and I'm going to make progress in small steps. And I... I genuinely don't believe that you can build complex systems any other way. AIs don't really work like that. They kind of make a they make a giant leap guess and say, "Here's your answer." And and as you said, they're not very good at refactoring. But that's hugely more important in building big complicated systems mm. um, than the initial your initial guess because because otherwise you've got to get it perfectly right first time. And it, however smart the AIs are. Mm. The chances of ever doing that are slim, are yeah. slimmer yeah. than than having a lot of shots at getting it right. Mm. So, th so the ability, the, when they're able to learn and iterate and change their minds and change direction, that seems like that's going to be a huge step. It seems to me at some point, mm. yeah. but they don't work like that at all yet. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say one thing is that is exactly like same as I said, it's still about team collaboration and yeah. it's the iterative things. And that's uh, often something that is left out when there's like a more simplified view on it and people just see, oh, I need documentation so I can just generate it. I need code. I can just generate it, right? Yeah. But kind of like forgetting these parts. Um, on the other hand, it's actually interesting because... Um, for these types of tasks that I was talking about, or generally tasks like, you know, writing a user story or breaking down an epic or helping you write an architecture decision record and trying to nudge you in the direction where you actually talk about why you're yes. taking the decision, what you need, right? Um, all of those uh, things, like, it's usually, you usually get better results if you get the AI to go in small steps as well. Yes. So, um, and so um, a lot of the the prompts that we're using kind of uh, um, are written in this way that you're going step by step so that the user can always like intervene yeah. and always sanity check the the work, right? And check the work like, oh no, you misunderstood that. I don't need that domain object or I don't need that data, please correct. And then you move on to the next step, right? Yeah. So that's like an interesting thing, but um, that doesn't apply to the refactoring problem, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 that when you think about what it takes to be able to do something like refactoring, you you come to a new code base and you know uh, change it for the better. There's 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 quite a lot of implicit stuff going on there, and it's hard to imagine without being able to select good code examples to show the AI. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so on, which is the same. Which is the, we can say the same for human beings. Really, yeah. it's a difficult that kind of 
design, sense of good design, sense, sense of quality in the solutions yeah, is yeah. a very hard thing to learn. Seems. And you're actually hitting on a very important point there that I uh, wanted to mention um, earlier as well with the user story. So um, we actually just released a, an, a podcast episode on the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast about AI and refactoring. And mm -hmm. we had Adam Tornhill on from yeah. um, CodeScene because you were talking about you need a lot of examples of what good code looks like. Yeah. And that is what Code Scene as a company, they, they have this product for um, code health uh, monitoring and also yeah. code health improvement. And they have that. They have all of this data about code smells and good looking code. So they actually did a lot of um, experiments with like getting large language models to refactor code and found that they were only successful in like, I don't know, 30, 35% of the cases yeah. or something. And then they took their data and other types of machine learning and other types of algorithms and put like kind of like a confidence check yeah. behind it and said, you know, always discard this if, you know, if it doesn't improve the quality or it changes the behavior. Yeah. And so their kind of like data is really helping them there. And that's like this, like it sometimes feels like data quality doesn't matter as much with large language models because it feels like, oh, I can make a spelling error. It doesn't yeah. mind. And it's unstructured data and it's fuzzy, yeah. right? But the content of the data still very much matters. And that's the same like when you're trying to build something for user story writing or other delivery tasks. How do you orchestrate the context that you give the AI so it can best help you? Which data do you feed it? Which do you not want to feed it because it's outdated? How do you explain to it that there are, that there are two words in the domain that mean different things? Yeah. Or, you know, So it's still very much just about that. It's not just as easy as like asking, like just throwing your confluence at it and asking it any questions and getting uh, magical results. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favourite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.